Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Inquirer Live, and I am Erin Haynes, the contributing editor for the Philadelphia Inquirer's A More Perfect Union. This is a series that examines the roots of systemic racism in America through many of the institutions that were founded right here in Philadelphia. So today we're going to talk about our latest installment, which deals with Chapter 5. We confronted the Institution of Medicine, and in When the Water Breaks, we share a story of America's first hospital and medical school that opened in Philadelphia. These institutions laid the groundwork for a maternal care system that disproportionately harms Black families. I'm thrilled today to be joined for this discussion by the writer of this article, Layla A. Jones, who researched, report, and wrote this amazing story. So Layla, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I'm excited. I'm excited too. Uh, so for those in our audience who may not have yet read your amazing article, can you just give us a brief synopsis of what you uncovered in When the Water Breaks? Yes, sure. So basically, like you said, um, this story focuses on the first hospital and the first medical school, Pennsylvania Hospital and UPenn's Medical School. So they're all in the same University of Pennsylvania system. Um, and then it zero ends more on the fact that Philadelphia is what, um, you know, I call the birthplace of obstetrics. So the field of obstetrics that we know today was also started here in Philadelphia. And along with the theme of this entire project um, and institutions in general, obstetrics began um, with inequity really baked into it. Yeah, yeah, and you lay that out so well in this piece. I'm wondering how you see some of these early institutions in Philadelphia, the first medical school, the first hospital, as really laying that groundwork for, for the inequality that you mentioned in the maternal care system that we have today for people who may not understand the connection between kind of that past and, and where we are right now with modern day Philadelphians giving birth and, and facing these same inequities. Yes. Um, well, you know, a lot of it is really kind of literal. So I'll start with the, I think a great example is the story of William Shippen Jr. Yes. And William Shippen Jr. is uh, one of the co-founders of Penn Medical School. And he also is what I called in the piece, the father of modern obstetrics. He took different fields that were disparate prior to his putting them together and created what we have as obstetrics today. So before William Shippen Jr. began teaching and practicing, most babies were born um, by midwives, female midwives. In the South, a lot of those midwives were enslaved women. In the North, it's not as clear, but it seemed like it was a lot of family members and they were usually all women. Um, he was the first male midwife. He also combined midwifery uh, with surgery. And that's why mm -hmm. our obstetricians today are surgeons. This was in the late 1700s that he was really putting this all together. Um, and so the reason that I say that obstetrics began with inequity baked into it is because of who William Shippen Jr. was and what he did to start his field. The first thing he did in one of the first um, private and publicized uh, medical lectures was advertise um, a small lying in or maternity ward hospital full of poor women patients for the sake of the education of students. Wow. So he basically created this mini uh, maternity hospital for women who otherwise wouldn't have been able to get care and used it to advertise for his students. Look, these are bodies that you can work on. Mm -hmm. These are people that you can learn from. Uh, it was on purpose in my opinion, because at the same time, he also had a private practice for wealthy paying customers. Mm -hmm. And that was not advertised. Um, and I'm guessing they weren't experimented on either. Right, right. They weren't used as teaching tools. Um, additionally, so that really dealt with poverty and how there was that class, um, that class chasm. But he also uh, used racism to launch this field mm -hmm. because uh, he introduced dissection into medical schools. And so it was really controversial at the time. Where did he get the cadavers from to right. dissect? He, one of the places that he got them from was by robbing Black burial grounds. Um, Robbing, he, he said. He, st he stole these bodies. He stole these bodies. Black cemetery. Yes. And he was such a prolific body snatcher that in the 1700s, he wrote about how Black people would arm themselves and guard the potter's fields and the, the mm -hmm. burial grounds that he and his, you know, 
aides were stealing bodies from. They would engage in gun battles trying to protect um, the people who were buried there. And I also want to note that, you know, any Philadelphians here, Washington Square is now a park near, you know, Independence Hall that everyone goes to. Um, it was one of the burial grounds that William Shippen Jr. used to steal um, deceased African people from. Yeah, definitely hallowed ground over at Washington Square. And frankly, all of what you're saying, Layla, is part of the untold story of the city, of Dr. Shippen and his legacy. I mean, I'm sure that, that Penn would much rather have, have him known as the father of modern obstetrics, holding him up in that way without really talking about this fuller history that you are, are uh, talking about, that, that you uncovered in your reporting. Can, can you talk about why you feel like it's important for the fuller history of Dr. Shippen, his role in obstetrics, and, and frankly, his role in, in uh, racial inequity around obstetrics, around maternal health, is important for us to know now. Well, yes, I think the reason that it's important for us to know now is because those inequities still exist now. And I feel like, you know, over the years, just casually, I always hear conversations about, you know, Black women die in childbirth. Black women are just more likely to die. They're just more likely to be sick. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, why? Why are Black women dying? Why are they having so many reports of not being listened to, not being cared for properly in the hospital? Um, not being able to advocate for themselves. Well, it's really because at the beginning, this field was not made for Black women, but it used Black women. Mm -hmm. um, obstetrics was never made to support Black women or poor Black women in the same way that it was wealthy white people who could pay. However, Black women's bodies were always used um, as teaching tools and to advance the medical field. And so now when you, you can fast forward at different points in the last two and a half um, centuries and see how those commonalities are threaded through. Um, one example is, like I said, William Shippen Jr. was working in the 1700s. Fast forward to the end of the 1800s, there's a story about a woman named Josephine Scott. Yes. And Josephine Scott was a black woman in Philadelphia, a free woman, and she also had a number of medical um, issues, apparently, like dwarfism. She was pregnant and she had to have a very um, gruesome delivery where her child did not survive. Um, but instead of being treated with dignity um, and instead of her body and her experience being honored, the white Philadelphia male physician who worked on her wrote about her case, ca calling her stupid he disrespected the place where she lived. And then he went so far as to, um, after her death, remove her pelvic bones and put them on display um, at the uh, Philadelphia Obstetrical Society, which was wow. the second in the country and also you know, one of the early institutions here in Philadelphia that has roots in racism. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, just such a, a horrible and harrowing story. Uh, those pelvic bones, where are they now? Are they still on display? What what happened to them? Well, actually, it's really just unclear where her pelvic bones are now. So we know that Josephine Scott, the rest of her body, not the pelvic bones, were buried in the almshouse burial ground, um, which side note, the almshouse burial ground was excavated in the early 2000s to make room for more of Penn's campus. So now Josephine Scott is somewhere else. Um, but when I reached out to the institutions that records said should have had um, Josephine Scott's remains, that was the Obstetrical Society or the College of Physicians and Mutter Museum, neither, um, no leadership at either institution could account for them at all. So it was just really unclear um, where her remains are. Wow, that is, um, yeah, I mean, just just really um, doing even more damage uh, to Josephine uh, and, and damage that has, is, is lasting and remains, frankly, unresolved. Um, we should know where, where those remains are. She should um, be resting in peace um, intact. And, and that is not something, uh, so even in death, she, she does not have the full dignity uh, that she deserves. Um, and and uh, but but I'm so grateful that your story is is really recognizing her contribution to um, 
obstetrics and, and the beginnings of, of what we consider to be modern day obstetrics in this country. Uh, I just want to say uh, we're about halfway through our conversation with Layla, but uh, for folks who are tuning in and who have had a chance to uh, either read Layla's story or, or are just really interested in this, this chapter and this topic, uh, you should feel free to submit questions. We're going to try to take a few questions here uh, before um, we get to the end of, of, of our event. So if there are things that, that this conversation is prompting for you, we would love to hear from you. Uh, and thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Layla, we're going to keep going here. Uh, I want to ask you just uh, really, um, I mean, I am learning so much from, from this entire series. I learned so much from reading your uh, piece uh, about um, institutional inequality in medicine and specifically in, in maternal health. I'm wondering what some of the things uh, in the course of your reporting, some of the things that surprised you or have really stayed with you um, in the course of, of reporting and telling this story? Um, I think some of the things that surprised me the most were the ways that you can see racist ideas still exist today mm -hmm. and are still perpetuated today in medicine. So um, in addition to being the home to, you know, obstetrics, Philadelphia also, you know, some experts and historians that I talked to was the center for race medicine. So these ideas, you know, like the Morton Skull Collection that a lot of people may know about that black people were inherently different and inherently like broken um, and that there was something wrong with us and that they used these arguments to help justify racism and slavery. Um, that was really happening and it was kind of seated here in Philadelphia. And that's still happening today. One of the craziest things that I learned about was something called the VBAC calculator. And it's the vaginal birth after a cesarean. And it's supposed to calculate the likelihood of success that a woman would have if she wanted to birth vagin vaginally after having a cesarean. Okay. The VBAC calculator became a national standard in 2010. So certainly not long ago at all. Mm -hmm. And it used race as a factor to predict success. So if I was a black woman and I put that I was a black woman, my likelihood for success would just drop because of that. Immediately. Mm -hmm. Immediately. Same if I was a Hispanic woman. And I know one of the people who is coming on later today is actually a mother who experienced this. So hopefully she gets a chance to tell that story. I won't say too much. But just the fact that that was so recent Mm -hmm. and that it only used race, no other medical conditions, no other information um, was used to drop that score, you know, other than just, are you black? Yeah, um, being, being a black woman was, was a pre-existing condition. Uh, that basically. was a factor, yeah, wow. yeah. And wow. I was also um, captivated by the fact that Penn still operates um, inequitable um, maternal care today. They still perpetuate that. Um, one thing is that they are one of the uh, birthing hospitals where mothers have access to midwives. Okay. Um, Penn operates two different hospitals. One is Penn C down at 8th and Spruce or Pine. And the other one is the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania up toward University City at 34th, 34th Street. Um, HUP at 34th Street treats, it's the blackest birthing hospital in uh, the city and Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania hospital is the whitest. It treats the most white people in the city. Um, midwives are available at Pennsylvania hospital 24 seven, 365. Anytime a mom comes in and wants a midwife, they can have one at HUP where most black patients are served. There are only midwives from 7 AM to 6 PM, I believe five days a week and not on holidays. And these are the same systems. Um, but they have that disparate, um, system of, of maternal care, even to this, to this day. Well, yeah, that, that is really striking. I mean, two different Philadelphias, if you are um, somebody who is, is giving birth in this city, really interesting, really mm -hmm. interesting to know. I mean, so, I mean, you're kind of starting to talk about, um, you know, what things may be different, how things maybe are improving, how things are maybe becoming, um, less equal, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, more equal uh, here in, in the city. I wanna ask you what you think, how, how can Philadelphia do better? How should Philadelphia be doing better? Um, you know, if this is a place that pioneered that inequality, what more can, 
is being done or should be done to, to pioneer making things less unequal? Well, I think, for example, having equitable midwife midwifery care across the birthing hospitals is one way. Um, some people that I spoke with talked about having the history of obstetrics um, taught in the medical schools and the nursing program so that people know the background of their field and maybe can become more cognizant of those biases that they might see or have themselves. Um, but there are also things that a lot of Black birthing professionals are doing already um, in the city of Philadelphia to try to change the tide, to try to improve maternal morbidity for Black women and other women of color. Um, one woman I spoke with, Salima McNeil, she runs the Oshun Family Center and the Maternal Wellness Village, yes. and she's partnering with Temple University, and they are doing this five-year-long study. I think they got like $2 million or more um, to pioneer ways that doctors can save Black women's lives. Mm -hmm. um, even Penn is doing things. They have um, a doctor named Dr. Florencia greer Polite. Yes. And she is um, she was named to this fellowship recently and she dedicated her fellowship topic to improving outcomes for black women by um, and black birthing people by helping her fellow doctors, especially white doctors, learn how to communicate and how to hear from and better care for um, black people. So there are a lot of initiatives happening, um, but I still think that it's important to understand the history because until then, you know, you may keep saying, well, Black women are just broken or they just have more comorbidities. And that's just not always true. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 as you um, so rightly point out, I mean, as we're learning with so many of these chapters, um, it is Black people who have to be part of their own solution, uh, you know, to address these inequities, uh, which is really, um, I mean, that, 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 continues to, the, to be the reality here in Philadelphia and across our country, our democracy, our society, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we are going to uh, now, I think uh, this would be a good time for us to open up this discussion. So I want to take uh, a moment to introduce a few people uh, that are going to be joining us in this conversation. We have Nicole Cole, who is a wife, a mom of two, and a patient who was featured in Layla's article, When the Water Breaks. Uh, we have Michelle Debing, who mm -hmm. is an associate professor of maternal fetal medicine at the University of Utah. And we also have Mary Nisi Lemon, who is a childbirth educator, a certified doula, a breastfeeding educator, and the author of a wonderful essay that accompanied this chapter on medicine that I encourage all of you to read if you have not read this about her own experience. Very powerful. And I so appreciate your contribution to uh, A More Perfect Union. Welcome everyone to this conversation. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank yeah, you so thank much you. for having me. Well, one thing, I just, I just want to throw this open to um, the group, honestly, because I think that this, you know, we're having this conversation. Uh, I think, I'm trying to remember, Layla, I think when your your story published, uh, we were either getting ready for the Dobbs decision or it had, or it had just recently uh, been announced. And so, you know, I think we are all kind of now thinking about the topic of maternal health, maternal mortality uh, in terms of uh, a post row reality, right? A post Dobbs reality. And so I'm wondering um, what that brings up for, for, uh, for all of our panelists, how this topic relates to kind of where we go from here in um, a world where, where uh, people's reproductive rights, reproductive access, um, has is is now being restricted certainly at the federal level and and increasingly uh, in states across the country. Uh, tell you what, let's start with uh, you, Michelle, and then we can we can come around. Sure. Thanks so much. Um, you know, I think it's a really important point. The you know one of the things that um, politically, socially, and emotionally um, that our sort of political landscape has done over the last. 30 to 50 years in terms of abortion care is to separate it from the rest of reproductive health care. Um, and I, um, I think that one of the things that the Dobb decision tells us is that, um, or at least that it should make us think about, is that in fact, those things are not separate, that reproductive autonomy and reproductive 
justice, that is, you know, the choice to have a child, to not have a child, and to parent those child under safe and healthy circumstances, which the idea, I have to say, the idea of reproductive justice was originated by some amazing Black women who now lead Sister Song um, in the early 90s on a, a human rights framework. But I think that that, you know, for me, the Dobbs decision really um, has um, escalated the conversation so that we can be talking about all of reproductive care in a continuum. I think it's important to acknowledge that um, just as many um, uh, many of the structures of um, obstetric care and maternity care harm Black women, many of the structures um, will, you know, for people who are forced to have unintended pregnancies carried to term, it's very likely that um, those same structures will continue to harm all of those women and that um, Black women, Indigenous women, and other women of color and um, birthing people of color will um, have, um, will shoulder an undue burden of uh, maternal mortality outcomes as a subsequent consequence of um, Roe v. Wade being overturned. Yeah. Um well, I want to come to you just, I mean, because uh, you know the role, uh, the importance of, of being able to, to advocate for yourself as, as a patient. Um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what the Dobbs decision brings up for you in terms of, of uh, pregnant people being able to do that, uh, you know, Black moms being able to do that. It's already such a challenge for Black moms to do that, but, but in an environment where reproductive rights are being restricted, um, does that make it even more challenging to, to, for Black women who are trying to advocate for themselves and for their health? I think so. And, and one thing I think that all of the attention has brought um, is that you can advocate still. And one thing that I don't want to be lost for Black women, Black mothers, is that you still can advocate. Um, I advocated for myself, like my life depended on it because it did. And I just want... Now that there's so much more attention on this issue, I just don't want that to get lost. And I don't want Black women to be afraid or fearful um, to speak up for themselves. And I think that that's kind of what's happened. There's a lot of fear surrounding reproductive rights, including um, maternal health, um, that, that I really hope that Black women don't, are not afraid to advocate for themselves in the way that they would have before. Nicole, you're making such a good point. I mean, we're having conversations about people being criminalized potentially, right? And not just uh, moms, but potentially the people who are helping them, right? Uh, helping them um, have access their reproductive rights. And which brings me to you, Mary Nisi. I mean, what what is this Dobbs, Dobbs decision bringing up for you in terms of reproductive rights, uh, questions of freedom and, and liberty and, and, and um, the criminalization of folks who may be trying to help people advocate for themselves. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And see, like I have a, a line that I always say, I would say it takes a village, yo. it takes a village. And really in this space, like um, I loved, you know, Layla's article just talking about like, there are these people who are coming in who are thinking through the same way. We have like these amazing birth workers here in Philadelphia specifically that are coming together and realizing, okay, like we, let's protect, let's advocate together, right? Because there is so much power when we're doing it together and realizing, listen, like we have to change the narrative, right? Like we literally have to change this. Like this is not um, okay. But it really comes to like, not just like the work I'm doing or what, you know, Nicole's doing or Layla, um, but really all of us coming in together and be like, hey, we're going to come in unison and we're going to like, that advocacy is going to be even so much stronger when we come and do it together, you know? Um, and exposing, exposing the, the history, like, um, we we won't know like where we need to be if we don't understand where we we came from, yeah. right? Like when Layla was talking about, um, you know, in the article talking about even the difference between a hub and Pennsylvania, right? Like so, you know, I do childbirth education, but I'm also in labor room with yes. families, yes. right? And literally, part of like the advocacy is at the beginning being like, "Where are you birthing? Oh, let's not let's not let's not do that. Let's mm -hmm. not do hub. Let's let's yeah. find something else because this is the history." But then being able to have this aha moment of like, oh, is that what happened? Is that where that came from? Right? Because mm -hmm. we don't know some of these things. Like, why are we here specifically with our city? Um, so, yeah, I love the idea that like we also have to, we do have to understand where we come from. Like, how did we get here? Um, and that's going to give us such a better um, 
you know, outlook of kind of like where do we need to go? Like how, kind of like how Dr. Michelle was saying, like we have to understand it's all connected. This is not like an isolated event that just happened, right? It, through the federal, it's some, this is a narrative that's been going on for, for a while. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the idea of strength in numbers and, and also, yes, that, that knowledge is power. Uh, absolutely. Uh, takeaways from uh, this moment and from this chapter. Uh, Nicole, I want to come back to you because I just want, you know, for those who are tuning in here who have not yet had a chance to read Layla's article, I'm really uh, grateful for you being here and, and for you sharing your story. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that you can just share with us your experience uh, in the maternal health care system here in Philadelphia uh, with the birth of your child in 2016. Um, so I have two sons. One of them is five. One just turned two. I had my five-year-old son, um, Jonah. We actually live in Maryland outside of D.C. So I had my five-year-old son, Jonah, in 2016 by C-section, um, labored at home with him until about seven centimeters, got to the hospital and was told after pushing for about two hours after I had gotten to after I was ready to push um, and just being told by a doctor who was not my regular doctor, you know, he's big, you'll never be able to get him out. There wasn't any counseling, there weren't there. I was never in distress. He was never in distress. The doctor just came in very coldly, told me and my husband that I needed to have a C-section. At that time, I didn't have a lot of information, um, but he told me his baby was big. There was a possibility his shoulders would get stuck. He could be injured. Um, and so I had a C-section and as and you, I, and you had, you had no time to react. I mean, that was just it. None, <laughs> none. And, and when I look back on it and I hear stories of, of, of cesareans where women really needed, um, cesareans, they were in distress. There was, there was something that was really causing that. And for me, I had been at home until seven centimeters. I took a 45 minute drive to the hospital. Um, and just as, it, it just was just a very cold, very transactional, I would say, experience for me. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, as I processed, I started to think, and as I learned more, because honestly, um, like I told Layla, when I was going in, I had no idea about the the experiences of, of Black women. I was, I was first time mom, naive, you just go in, you have a baby, and you go home, and that's it. Um, but as I started to research afterwards, I knew that my experience was not normal. It wasn't what should have happened. Um, and I knew that I wanted a different experience um, when I was, whenever um, my husband and I decided to continue to grow our family. So I was pregnant in 2020, um, was actually 20 weeks on the day that the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. Um, and I decided to start at a birthing center near my house started at that birthing center one week into the pandemic after 20 years they announced that they were closing i had met with three different midwives um at this point you could not have a doula many hospitals weren't even allowing partners in in the birthing room at that time so um i i <laughs> i didn't know what to do so i got a suggestion to switch to another hospital another um Midwifery, I did that. I went into the first appointment, had the VBAC calculator done on me for the first time throughout my entire pregnancy at about um, late into 20 weeks. She said, you know, well, you have about a 30% chance of a VBAC. I want you to know that. Um, very, again, very cold. And I got in the car and I called my husband and I was so frustrated and I said, this is not it. And then I went into the calculator and I changed black from white. I kept my weight, kept my height. I kept the reason for cesarean the exact same, and the percentage dropped significantly, more than 20%, um, the, the possibility that I would have a birth, uh, a vaginal birth. This is a long story. I'm going to try to wrap it up. Oh, no. but, you take your time telling this story. <laughs> this is important. Um, this is important, and this my, happened to you. My husband had a friend who is uh, was a doula in another area, and she told us if I wanted a vaginal birth, my best chance was at George Washington Hospital in D.C., which was about 30 minutes away uh, outside of our house. The midwifery at George Washington Hospital is very popular. They have an entire program. They really don't bring people on last minute, but I was up late at night working on my pitch. I called them the next morning, and I'm like, look, I'm at this point. 
I had researched so many different places and was actually fearful to switch so late in during a pandemic. But I knew that my, I knew that I was not having another cesarean. I used to tell my husband, like, if we deliver this baby in the car, we're doing that. I'm not having another, I'm not having another birth like the one that I had. So I was able to switch to the OBs first at George Washington Hospital. And one of the OBs, she really, I said, you know, I really want to go to the midwives. I really, really think that would be my best chance. And she advocated for me. She sent an email to the midwives. I went to my first appointment with the midwives. I met a Black midwife um, at George Washington, Anaya. Um, and I met her and I told, I went in the car and I told my husband, she's the one, she's going to deliver the baby. It was one out of six chances that I would get her. I went into labor the very next day and she was there and she delivered my baby before I even signed the VBAC consent form. <laughs> I have a picture of me signing the VBAC consent form, holding my baby. Um, and one of the things that I, I think was so important for me and that I tell pregnant women, you are not married to these doctors, to these midwives. If you have a bad experience, you can, I literally met this woman the 24 hours before I had, had, had a baby. Um, the other thing is two weeks before I had my son, they allowed doulas back in at George Washington, but not at the hospital I was originally going to birth. So I wouldn't have been able to have a doula. I found a doula on Instagram, um, sent her a DM. It was like, listen, <laughs> I need a doula in two weeks. Like, can you help me out? She was amazing. Um, and, and I just had such a different experience. And one thing about me, like I'm originally from Michigan. I'm like this Midwestern girl. I'm so big on politeness. So, so many times it seemed wrong to switch or to speak up for myself. And especially as Black women, we're sometimes fearful. We don't want to be seen as angry or combative. Speak up for yourself. Don't be afraid. You can switch. You can say what you don't want. You can say what you don't like. Um, and really just want to empower um, people to say that. And then and then just my final thing, as I am like the big baby lady, um, I'm not a very big person myself, but my, my oldest son was nine pounds. And my second son that I literally pushed out in three big pushes was eight pounds. So he was big too. Um, I did some chiropractic care. I did a lot of walking um, to help me out. But the, the biggest thing in, in my outcome the second time was just the care team and the hospital that I chose. Well, I'm so glad that you were treated with the dignity that you deserved the second time around. But that is because you fought for that. You, you yeah. fought to be treated the way that you deserve to be treated, the way that everyone, uh, you know, that, that is giving birth deserves to be treated. I mean, listen, I, I love what you said about, you know, your Midwestern politeness, may, worrying about that, maybe getting getting in the way for you of, of you pushing for yourself. I mean, also, look, I mean, you're you're. A mother to be, you're not. You don't have a medical degree necessarily. I mean, I'm wondering. I'm. I'm just picturing you, you know, scared and 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 trying to give birth, and having a doctor tell you, oh well, you, the baby's too big, and that just being kind of the end of discussion. I mean, for mothers to be, what are they supposed to do when they're told something like the baby's too big, since that, you know, was going to be kind of a go-to reason for you? Like, what does that even mean? I don't know. He he was a big baby, but so was the second one. <laughs> and, and I pushed him out I very. I pushed him out very easily. Um, and and with my first labor that ended in C section, it was, it there were no complications. He was. I was pushing for for a while, but at no point was he in distress. I wasn't in distress. Um, but he would, it would come out a little and then he'd go back. But I also labored completely on my back. They didn't help me get into different positions where in my second experience, they they had so many, so many different things that for me to do. The nurses that were there, do you want to get on all fours? Do you want to stand up? Do you want to walk? They had all of these different things for me to do to help kind of ease him out, knowing that that he was he was bigger too. Yeah. Mary Nisa, I see you nodding your head in agreement. You you are somebody who has been in the room, who has helped people like Nicole um, bring a baby into this world. Um, it certainly sounds like it was helpful to Nicole to have somebody who shared her lived experience there. Right. It, right. Talk to me about the value of that. Talk to me about what your patients, I mean, is there even something that comes over them when they see somebody like you, when they meet somebody like you, 
what does that do for their peace of mind when they when they are going through um I mean a life changing event like like giving birth. Right, right. No, I'm literally getting chills listening to your story, Nicole. I read about it, but it's a whole nother thing hearing yes, absolutely. hearing you share. So thank you, you know, thank you so much for, yes. for sharing your story with us. That's so powerful. No, it really makes a difference. Like, you know, the you know, the doula work, right? I always say like this work is not new, right? Like in other traditions, in other countries, right? Even before time, like we had you had like women of the village who would come in and walk alongside not just the birthing person, right? Not just the mama, but and the dad and the partner, right? Like and the family kind of like bringing in that education, that like um emotional support, right? That physical support. Like this work is not new. Unfortunately, we're in, you know, 2022 and people obviously have moved They're in different spaces. People don't have those villages anymore. So really that's what a doula is. It's coming to kind of like try to fill some of that role of coming in, being that third person who is coming in like in prenatal, right? Mm-hmm. Like doing that education and doing that preparation in prenatal and then in labor room with you the whole time. Like I'm, I'm excited hearing that you found somebody on IG and in two weeks, they were there with you in labor room. I'm like, that's incredible. That's what that was, right? Like, that is literally being there physically, someone who does represent you, who is there for you, right? And that, like, sometimes, like, some hospitals say, well, the doula is part of, like, the medical team. I'm like, I understand what you're saying, but really, we're there for the family, right? Because we have a created we have a relationship like we know what you want we know some of those things like you're like oh like I'm really scared to advocate like what does it look like we get creative we do code words y'all in labor room right like listen but a way really to create safety to create that safety for you to be able to birth it goes a long way so just even having you know someone uh, in there with you and of course like I always say part of why I even started doing childbirth education was that very fact of like, we need to start that at the very beginning, right? It's not just in labor room, we don't walk in and it works out, right? It starts at the beginning, right? Bringing in your support people to really learn and understand and hear those kind of conversations of like, what hospital are you birthing? Have you decided maybe choosing another place to birth that's not a hospital, right? Like that happens before, before, uh, before birth. Um, and I'm very passionate about, like I've been uh, the past few years really supporting first time parents because those stories of my first birth went this way and coming in then to, you know, to find like other ways. Like for me, that has always broken my whole heart. I think my story even shares what my first experience was. And I'm like, ah, oh, we've got to do better. We've got to start at the very beginning, right? When you're having that first child, um, really understanding like, what is it that you're experiencing? What it is that's happening? Um, and what does that mean for you? Um, if you're a black mom, right? Walking into birth. And not after and be like, I wish. Because unfortunately, some of those people are not here to even tell us I wish, right? Because something happened. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I want to stay with you for just, just one more question here, Mary Nisi, because uh, we've got a question from the audience. Cynthia Carter. Thank you, Cynthia, for this question. Cynthia is asking, are there more training programs available to engage women of color as doulas, health advocates, and midwives? What if somebody is wanting to get into this work? What, what can they do? Right. No, there definitely is. There is a lot more. There's like a whole uprise even here specifically in our city that is training doulas. Like I was actually turned, uh, I was trained with Maternity Care Coalition that has a program of community doulas. So what's happening is they're walking in, I think it was like the 20 of us, and we're really getting this like amazing training. Then we get to go out into like our city, you know, obviously here um, to do the work. So there is, there's an uprise of like people who are coming in specifically supporting uh, you know, black people that are wanting to do this work and be this work. There is scholarships now, like in these places that you can go to, even with evidence-based uh, birth, right? They will literally give you a scholarship for you to be part of their team because you're black, because they're like, hey, we need more people here, more birth workers that look like me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michelle, I want to come to you um, and ask if you could respond to this question from Jennifer Pitt. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks who is asking, are you seeing differences in the outcomes or impact among age groups of birthing parents? Mm -hmm. And what are some suggestions for new approaches for those of us working with adolescent birthing people in a community or school setting to address this issue? I think that's a really good question. I, um, you know, I want to dovetail a little bit on what Mary Nisi was saying, which is um, that the use of doulas is experiential and intergenerational wisdom that um, that 
it builds upon and that we have lost over time, largely due, I think, in a lot of ways, speaking as a doctor, to the medicalization of birth. Um, and I, it's been really exciting to see the uprising of doulas who I think could actually, my apologies, y'all, um, some folks just walked into the office that I'm using. Um, so, um, you know, I think the, that the uprising of doulas and doula training, and in particular doula trainings that are concentrated a, around um, bringing more um, women of color uh, back into, into the sort of the traditions that one of the doulas that I work with likes to call it bringing herself and her colleagues back into the traditions of the granny midwives um, that she descended from in the U.S. South. And so I think... Um, you know, that's a really important piece that can actually ad address that question that you were asking, like, how do we um, help adolescents? I think adolescents are a prime group of individuals who are, um, you know, birthing people who are at high are at higher risk or more likely to be vulnerable to lack of information. Um, and I think that having um, individuals who are excited to be their doulas um, and excited to help walk them through childbirth um, is a, a wonderful um, way to help adolescents. I've also been involved in a lot of group prenatal care. And um, I think that group prenatal care can also provide a strength of community, the social support um, between birthing people, right? So as a person who provides group prenatal care, my role is really to like take vital signs, listen to babies, make sure that like the physical things are okay, and to provide an opportunity for a handful of educational points. But really the questions and education are driven a lot by the group and they teach each other. Um, and, and by the end of pregnancy, they have really developed a lot of um, a lot of connection with one another and a lot of social support that carries them through even the postpartum period, um, which I think is a super wonderful um, outcome to see happen as you're working with a group of, of pregnant and birthing folks who are going through a group together. So I totally agree with Mary Nisi about, you know, starting early um, and making sure that, um, you know, we, uh, you know, and in, in the traditional medical model in the United States, Prenatal care is supposed to be, you know, a routine routine obstetrics visit is like less than 10 minutes for most people. And it's really not enough. It's not enough time because it's such a it's 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 such a unique time, but a short span of time in a reproductive uh, birthing person's life. But it's a time that for the first time moms, especially, they've never had experience with this before. And so taking that extra time to really make them feel comfortable, make them feel like they're getting the knowledge that they want and need to advocate for the kind of birthing experience that they want. I think those are all critical pieces. Um, and I guess sort of scientifically to answer the question, yes, outcomes are different at different ages. Um, you know, we have this kind of bimodal distribution, um, which basically just means like young people and older people can be affected by things like severe maternal morbidity and, and maternal mortality more commonly. I love both of the answers. So thank you for all of all of that. That was very thorough. And And I mean, I just hear all of you continuing to talk about the value of the village before, during, after, um, the importance of really the relationships um, that a birthing uh, person needs uh, in order to have um, the most ideal outcome that, that they can have for themselves and for the child. Um, I wanna come around to all of you for, for one more question before we go to final thoughts. And um, that uh, this is prompted by, uh, I don't actually know your name, but username is hbsherm61. So thank you for uh, for this prompt. But first thing that each of you would do, so one thing you would do to increase favorable outcomes for a pregnant woman today, early doctor visits, better nutrition, women groups, hospital visits, one thing that, that you would do to increase a favorable outcome for, for a pregnant woman right now. Um, Mary Nisi, I'll start with you this time. As I was like, whoa, which one would it be? There's like <laughs> well, anything. It, it doesn't have to be one of those. Anything. Uh, um, I mean, definitely just, um, I mean, I always want to go back to the education, but in a way that it meets people where they're at, right? Like I, sometimes I don't love the word education because it ends up being the separate thing that is only for a very specific people. Um, but definitely, yeah, like a ho holistic, like wholesome education around like birthing and understanding specifically that like when we talk about this maternal mortality, like it's not just when they're giving birth, right? Like when you actually look at like what is actually maternal, you know, mobility, like when it's actually like even after like a year after the baby is born. Mm -hmm. 
right? So if you, you know, you were able to like echo that, you know, we're talking about the village like before birth and after, because that is all connected, right? Because what's happening is, you know, the baby is born, here's the baby now go home, right? What, what happens after, right? And you have like one, one postpartum visit, like after six weeks, I'm like, what do you mean, right? So it's really that wholesome, like in that holistic, like education that is meeting people where they're at in understanding, right? That it's not just about before, it's not just about birth, but it's not just about after, it's all of it. And it is all connected. And our story, you know, when we even talk about, you know, August is, excuse me, like a month of like breastfeeding, right? We talk about breastfeeding and, you know, and chest feeding, like, and we bring awareness to that. It is all connected. It starts like in prenatal, at birth and after, right? This is like a very like connected um, story, a very connected narrative of what our bodies do in, in the birthing. So yeah, that wholesome um, education that really meets people where they're at and understanding that this is like a whole, this is like a whole thing here, y'all. <laughs> yeah, Hol a holistic approach to, edu to education. Yeah. Nicole, what about you? One one thing uh, that you would you would recommend to increase favorable outcomes. Oh, goodness. Um, so I, mine feels very huge, but I just think increased access um, to midwifery care and, and doulas for, for all birthing people. Um, one of the things that, that I always acknowledge is, is the privilege of having health insurance that was accepted at four different hospitals. So mm -hmm. I could make the decision to leave because I could and I didn't have to worry about the cost and being in network and whether I would be accepted with different um, doctors. But all, all mothers, all birthing people don't have that. So I would love to see increased access to that type of care. Um, that is a that is a great one. And and that is huge, but uh, don't think it's too much to ask for, for mm -hmm. birthing folks in, in uh, you know, the uh, a country as prosperous as this one. Uh, mm -hmm. Michelle, I'm going to I'm going to give you uh, the last word on a favorable outcome for a pregnant woman. What What, what is the one thing you would say? Um, I appreciate getting the last word, although <laughs> not sure I can do a lot better than those two answers. I fully agree. Um, I think, though, that my the way I see my role as someone who's both a clinician and a researcher is that, especially as someone who's like a, a public health and population sciences researcher, is that um, we, you know, I like to see medical complications as people in a river who are about to go over a waterfall, right? And that's, there's an important piece of, can we help people get out of the river before they go over the waterfall? Um, and that might be throwing a life vest. It might be helping them build a kayak. It's all those kinds of things. And those are the things that Mary Nisi is, is kind of talking about in terms of the holistic education. Here's all the stuff you need to build a kayak to get out of the river before you go over the waterfall. But I think there's also another piece about who's pushing people in the river in the first place. Um, and that's the piece that my public health brain and my social structural brain is always kind of thinking about, which is we got to we have it's a both and you have to be able to help people get out of the river before they go over. But we also need to stop pushing people in in the first place mm -hmm. and kind of what Nicole um, is talking about is one of the ways that we push people in is by inequitable access to the kinds of care that will help people to have the safe and types of birth that they want. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that, you know, if I could fix one thing that would help people have safe births in an equitable way from an equity focus is to end structural racism and other structural oppressions, right? The reason that Black women have higher maternal mortality rates is not because Black women are inherently more likely to die in childbirth. It is because of the structure of our system that sets them up in that way and that we don't have the resources to, um, we, we have not shown the political wherewithal to, to take away, dismantle those structures. And so if I were going to say one thing that would um, even the playing field in terms of maternal outcomes, it would be to remove the structures of oppression that are pushing people in that river at unequal rates. Absolutely. And, and you know, this is a project that is showing the interconnectedness of all of these things that are contributing to um, inequity across our society and in, in all of these different institutions. Well, Layla, the final thought I'm going to uh, I'm going to call on you for uh, because I, I want to know what you um, are hoping people take away from your article. What is the thing that you want people to learn? What is the thing that you want to happen as a result of, of you reporting and writing this piece? Yes, um, I think that what I hope people take away um, is kind of multi-layered. First, I think what Dr. Debbie just said, which is that 
um, black women are not broken. There's not anything inherently wrong with us as being born African American or black American or black anywhere um, that makes us more likely to have bad outcomes. Um, and so I think that if professionals could go into these birthing rooms, instead of thinking this is a woman I need to save because she's black, they would just think this is a woman or a person um, and then have everyone on an equal playing field. Um, I hope that that's a takeaway. And I also hope that um, this reporting can help to improve outcomes because there are still tangible things that institutions are doing that they can change right now um, that could improve outcomes. For example, the, out, the access to midwifery care at the two different hospitals. I mean, that's happening right now in Philadelphia, in Penn System, which is like has a billion dollar endowment or whatever they have. I mean, it's just like not necessary. I don't think. Who am I? I don't know. Um, so yeah, I just hope that my biggest takeaway is that this, um, my hope is that people use this reporting to make tangible change. Um, and even I'm so encouraged by that person who asked, how can I like become an educator, childbirth educator? Um, so more childbirth educators would be awesome. Yeah. Well, I certainly encouraged by folks who want to be part of the solution, but also, yes, starting with an understanding that Black women are not broken and uh, honoring uh, stories like uh, Nicole's, like Mary Nisi's, uh, like Josephine Scott's, who we will not allow to be forgotten, um, just feels uh, so valuable. So who are you? You are the person that brought all of that to our attention. And I so, so appreciate your contribution uh, with this chapter. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. And thank all of you so much uh, for your insight, for your vulnerability, and, and for your transparency to help uh, us convene what, what I feel like has really been such a robust conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yes, thank you all so much. Absolutely. And thank you to our audience for joining uh, Inquirer Live's latest installment of A More Perfect Union uh, to read Layla uh, A. Jones's article, When the Water Breaks, as well as previous articles in the A More Perfect Union series. You can visit inquirer.com slash more perfect union. You can also sign up for our free newsletter to receive notifications about future chapters as they are being published. I'm your host, Erin Haynes, the contributing editor for More Perfect Union, and I hope to see you all next time on Inquirer Live. Have a good evening. Stay safe, take care, and stay cool.